All right. So this is um, part of the NAGT on the Cutting Edge um, webinar series. This particular one is sponsored by the Getsy program. But if you're interested in learning more about the series uh, and the other projects that are sponsoring different aspects of it, you can go to uh, the NAGT website uh, at, at any of these different numbers, uh, page numbers, you can also just Google for an AGT and webinar to find this series. So the project that's sponsoring today is Geodesy Tools for Societal Issues, um, and we'll be talking about in the realm of geodesy, GPS in particular, the Measuring the Earth with GPS mo um, module that was written by Karen Quartz and Jessica Smay. If you're interested in also having the webpage up at the same time, you're welcome to um, go to the Getsy webpage. It's the first module that's listened, listed on our front page. Uh, this is uh, an NSF-supported project. I am Beth Pratt-Situla, I'm the project manager for Getsy, and Karen Quartz will be speaking um, in after a little while on the, the module itself after I give the introduction here. UNAVCO runs the geodetic facility for NSF um, and is thus interested in promoting um, geodesy education. So thinking to the uh, the philosophy behind uh, the Getsy project it is in partnership with the Integrate project, which many of you are probably familiar with. And a lot of the vision behind these um, comes from no, um, the two twin, significant twin challenges that we face. One is uh, just the many Earth uh, and society, you know, related uh, challenges from climate change to water resources to um, geohazards, also uh, the charge that many of us have to uh, educate uh, students in STEM related fields. And it actually turns out that this has a complementary path to improvement if we situate the STEM learning in the context of societal challenges and questions, we can not only um, help the students engage better, they learn better, and may actually go on in STEM fields and help us address some of these challenges that we face as a society. Um, so the Getsy project in particular is um, working on developing and disseminating teaching and learning materials that feature geodesy data and quantitative skills. Um, and so this sort of data and quantitative skills is a little bit heavier emphasis with Getsy than it is um, with some of the other integrate modules um, and especially applied towards climate change, water resources and natural hazards. Four grants funded um, on both introductory and majors level grants so far, uh, or uh, sorry, teaching level so far, both classroom and field. This particular um, uh, webinar is emphasizing introductory classroom module. Of the 13 uh, that are either published or near published, um, uh, two are for the field and the rest are for classroom. They're about two or so weeks each. Just to make sure we're on the same page about what uh, ge uh, geodesy is, when I say that, uh, it's the science of accurately measuring the Earth's size, shape, uh, orientation, mass distribution, and, and a very importantly, how they vary with time. So where is everything on the earth and how do we know that? Originally, this was pretty much surveying, so precise positioning of points on the earth. But in the last few decades, the toolbox of techniques that we can apply towards geodesy uh, uh, issues has just blossomed. And so it includes, if you were to unpack the geodesy toolbox, GPS, which is of course what we'll be talking about today, uh, but also uh, synthetic aperture radar satellites, um, which are really good at regional deformation, um, be it for earthquakes, volcanoes, um, groundwater, uh, any high resolution topography, which we might get from LIDAR or we might get from structure from motion is considered part of geodesy, strain meters, tilt meters, creep meters, gravity measurements, most especially um, the grace and grace follow on satellites and um, sea level and ice altimetry. So this is more of the toolbox with the GPS, of course, being the emphasis today. Um, all of the Getsy modules um, and integrate modules have very similar guiding principles, are guided by these philosophies. They need to address one or more geodesy related grand challenges. Um, they need to make use of authentic and credible data, science data, in this case, geodesy data. Students need to um, improve their understanding of the nature and methods and communication of geoscience. Uh, students uh, in, 
develop the ability to address interdisciplinary problems. So not just at the level like earthquakes can knock down buildings and then move on and never talk about the societal part, but to bring it back to aspects of policy um, and planning and economics in some way and to increase student capacity to apply quantitative skills. Uh, in, if you're familiar with Integrate, they emphasize system thinking a bit more. The, the model that was used for Integrate and Getze modules is, um, is in alignment with uh, backwards design. So starting with learning goals, um, coming to more granular um, outcomes, then the next step being how would you know that the students have achieved those outcomes and goals, and then moving on to the teaching materials and planning the instruction. There's a process for piloting the materials and revising. So all of the modules, including this one, you'll hear about today went through this process. Now I want to practice a little bit, make sure people's controls are working okay, and just sort of get a sense for where people are at. So um, if you're not seeing the control panel, you can kind of wave your arrow near the bottom of your screen and you'll um, see the participants uh, window. You can get that to pop up. So raise your hand if you already use GPS in your teaching. So um, I'll give people a couple minutes. So this is exciting. It looks like we have um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, about 11 people. So about a third of the people that are on already use GPS in some capacity. So um, that helps us know. So two thirds of the people maybe um, haven't used it yet. Uh, now, so go ahead and unraise your hands so we don't have those hands raised any longer. And now we'll practice the poll feature. So can you pop up the poll? And I'll just put the questions here. If you're on a browser or just on the, um, then you, you won't necessarily see the poll come up. Okay, so uh, do yourself, you see yourself increasing the use of data in lecture, lab, or homework? Check all that apply. So we'll give people a chance to, to put things in. All right, I would say we'll end the poll and we'll share. So people are, if you can see it, um, the poll is definitely showing that lab is 72% uh, of the people are saying that lab is where they would put it, about 40% in lecture and, um, uh, yeah. and oops. Um, 32% in, um, in the, so I've pasted it into the window if, if you're on a browser and you can't see it. So uh, hopefully people can see that. So that sort of gives us a sense for how the polls will work. Now I wanted to um, give you a little more background into GPS, research grade GPS. Um, go, oh, the poll. Okay, so what is GPS? Uh, GPS receivers are, of course, in phones and cars and basically anything that tells you where you are is probably a GPS receiver. Um, this is a great entry point for engaging students because they all have one or maybe more in their pockets. Um, I did just want to note for the terminology that officially GPS is the US component of the Global Navigation Satellite System, which also includes Russia, Europe, China, and, and others. Um, but because people aren't familiar with GNSS, um, we'll be using the term GPS, although technically most of what we're talking about today is pulling data from more global sources. This is what the US's GPS satellites look like. Um, and then the receiver obtains the signals that are transmitted by these satellites. There are 24 to 32 of them in the US system. Um, we really precisely know the orbits and times. Um, and then any GPS receiver is listening to them. And then to, to get a position, you need to start with um, at least four. So, and 
And they essentially, this is because there are four variables. We have north, south, east, west, and elevation is a good way to think about it with intro students. If you're talking to a GPS scientist, they probably call it XYZ end time. Um, the time aspect comes in because um, our phones have considerably less good uh, uh, time in them than, than uh, or even the GPS, the research grade GPS receivers than the satellite's atomic clock. So we need to solve for that unknown as well. Um, so the difference with a research grade, uh, survey grade GPS is that um, it has the same basic components, but they're just bigger and much better at what they do. This is uh, underneath this dome is the antenna. The legs here are drilled into this bedrock. They can also be drilled into sediment, although they'll go much deeper in that case. Um, and so if this piece of earth on the crust uh, is moving, then the antenna is moving and it records its position change. The receiver, the brains, are inside this white box. Since it's a remote site, this particular one has solar panels and, um, and then other things like communication data storage and batteries. So if we're looking at the accuracy and precision, um, the errors uh, for a research grade instrument after eight hours um, are millimeter scale errors, two to four in the horizontal, maybe 10 to 15 in the vertical. That gets down to just a couple millimeters after a day or so. Uh, it works the same principle for handheld devices, although they will never get under you know, 10 to 15 meters of accuracy, even with more uh, collection time, they'll still be meters of error. Uh, one thing that gives us much uh, capacity in the research realm is that the rates of the research GPS are um, able to get things as little as a millimeter per year um, after collecting a couple years of data. So this gives us a lot of insights into the crust. Um, when the GPS stations were first put in, they were really thinking in terms of uh, plate tectonics, I have circled down here at the bottom, um, and uh, earthquakes and volcanoes. But what we've really found is the position information from GPS can be, and this is what you'll hear from hear about in the rest of the webinar a lot, also the water cycle and the cryosphere cycle, just the position information um, can can tell us a lot about the hydrosphere as well. Just as an aside, which is not the main focus of today's webinar, uh, it actually turns out that there's quite a bit of other things we can learn from the GPS data. For instance, the reflected GPS signal, um, which was supposed to be just noise, we found out it could give us information about the surface, assuming it's a natural surface and not like a building or a parking lot, on things that range from soil moisture to vegetation height, sea level, snow no depth and things like that. Turns out that the, uh, the slowing down of the direct signal um, and other things that are different from what you'd expect in a complete vacuum give us information about the water vapor in the troposphere and the conditions in the ionosphere. So there's a lot of things that we can learn from GPS. Today specifically, we'll be doing um, the hydrosphere and plate tectonics and earth. So now um, we'll pass it over to um, my co-presenter, Karen, and she'll talk to you about the Measuring the Earth with GPS module itself. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So I'm Karen Kortz, and I developed this module with Jessica Smay, my co-author. Um, and we looked at uh, how GPS, um, students can use GPS to learn about different aspects of the world, um, and we decided to focus on just one um, part of geodesy, the GPS part, um, so that students can learn more about one instrument, become familiar with it, and then apply it to many different situations. All right, next slide. Sorry, that's right, that's me. Got it. <laughs> I'm on it now. <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, so our, the goals of this module is that we wanted students to be able to quantitatively analyze deep GPS data and then use that analysis to interpret um, why, the, why there's motion, so the geoscientific cause um, of the motion. And then we wanted students to draw on their GPS data, the, what they just analyzed, um, to make societal recommendations and specifically, this, these recommendations are relative to earthquake hazards, 
glacial change, and then water resource management. Our module has four units in it. And the first unit, Unit 1, is focused on just sort of the basics of collecting GPS data. Um, and it is sort of an introduction to GPS and how the data are presented. And then Units 2 through 4 are then applications of that. So Unit 2 focuses on earthquakes and plate motion. Unit 3 focuses on glaciers and sea level rise. And then Unit 4 um, focuses on groundwater and water resources. So unit one, this is the kind of the introductory unit. Um, the very first part of this is a lecture about GPS, um, similar to the lecture Beth gave, but we've actually embedded um, some questions for students to answer within that lecture. And then part two is a jigsaw activity where students analyze GPS um, as part of a jigsaw. Um, and this could be done as a jigsaw or it can be done more as individual worksheets. There's a lot of flexibility in how this is used. Um, so if it's used as a jigsaw, students divide into three teams. Um, and these one team looks at the, at the concept of reference frames for GPS. What are you moving relative to? Another team looks at the direction of motion, and we're going to be doing that soon. And then the third team looks at the speed of motion. How do you figure out how fast stations are moving? And then finally, at the end, um, students then recombine into new groups, which each group having a representative from each of those three teams, and they solve other problems. And again, I'll give you an example of that. All right, so here is your first look at the GPS data that we used in this unit. Um, so we have three different stations um, shown here, and each station has a north component, an east component, and a height component. So I'd like you to look at the first station, um, station SEAT, and look at the data that's showing you that um, that's presented there, and act like a student and figure out what direction that station is moving. So I think we'll have a poll yeah, pop up. Yeah, do you want to, are we, yep. Okay. Um, and then, um, yeah, it looks like you can do them all at once. So you'll do this for each of the stations, um, uh, each of the three stations presented. And I think you might need to move your little poll box out of the way so you can look at the, the uh, stations behind there. Uh, Beth, I can see the box, by the way. You can see the poll box? Yeah. Oh, okay, awesome. Yay. <laughs> Um, so I'll give you about 30 more seconds to, um, to fill this in, or Beth might cut us off early, uh, depending on how quickly we respond. All right, I'm gonna end it. It looks like we got uh, slowed down the amount. Um, and so, so if you're seeing the poll then, Karen, then I think people should yeah. be able to see it. So we have uh, nine, Northeast for uh, a seat, 93% <laughs> of the people voted for that. We have Northwest for PKRD, 87% um, for that and not moving to uh, north 80%, uh, but some people said uh, northeast for the mayor station. All right, excellent. So it looks like you guys um, can figure out uh, the directions that GPS stations are moving. And again, this is something that we would guide the students to a little bit more. I wouldn't just throw it at you um, or throw it at the students. Um, it would kind of work with them a little bit to kind of figure out which way is positive, which way is that going, and kind of combining that. Um, so, uh, so then, yeah, so here are the answers, um, which is what most of you answered, which is wonderful. And, and I think the question of whether mayor is considered slightly northeast or not moving, you know, can be contextualized by, by the instructor. Both, you know, have reasons for being answered. <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. All right, and then so 
so after all the different um, teams of students work through um, you know, each of their different uh, specialties, again, this is, we just went through the specialty of, for the direction of motion, then we have the groups come together and one of the questions we ask them is to explain why their station is moving. Um, and we tell them at this point that the horizontal motion is due to tectonic plate movement and then vertical motion could be plate tectonics or it could be water cycle motion. And that can either be a seasonal trend or it could be a long-term trend if the area is gaining or losing water. So what I would like you to do is I would like you to look at these three different stations and I want you to come up in your head um, with why you think these stations are moving. And I'll give you 30 seconds to do that. Okay. All right. Um, so Beth, you want to show the next slide? All right, so these are the locations of these stations. Um, so Seattle, Washington, um, this station is moving uh, north and east because of plate tectonics. And then um, it also has a seasonal change um, in their height, and that is due to a seasonal change in the water cycle. Los Angeles is also moving because of plate tectonics, um, but it does not have quite such a seasonal change in the water cycle. Um, and then Mississippi um, is not really moving um, relative to the ref stable reference frame, the North American reference frame, um, but it, it does have the vertical motion um, because of uh, change in the water cycle. Um, and we don't at this point talk about like what's happening in the water cycle, like why that may cause the ground to move up and down, but that's something that um, students start to wonder and that's something that we do get into with units three and four. All right, um, so that was unit one, kind of an introduction to how GPS works. And hopefully you get a sense of kind of what, we, um, what we've done in the module. The units two through four all have a similar structure um, where they're divided into three parts. Um, part one is where students are guided through an example um, and a way of thinking by a scientist that kind of the scientist um, shares their thought process and guides the students to kind of working through some of the fundamentals of, you know, of the glaciers or of the plate tectonics or of the groundwater. And then students watch an animation, um, and that animation we've um, created questions for the students to answer as they're watching the animation to make sure they are focusing on what we want them to focus on. And then part three, um, students then apply what they've learned um, and kind of expand um, it to a broader analysis, and that's the sec part where they solve a societally relevant problem. Here are the uh, examples of the societally relevant problems for each of these units. So in unit two, the earthquakes and plate motion, um, students provide advice to a friend on where to move in California um, since that friend can't afford earthquake insurance. Unit three, um, they are looking at whether people should invest in ocean, oceanfront property um, for retirement and that's related to glacial melting, um, which causes sea level rise. And then unit four, um, students look at the, whether or not there should be restrictions on the amount of groundwater used during a drought. So this is an example of the framing of these questions. And again, um, for each of these three units, the framing is all very similar to each other. So students get familiar with how this is done if you use this, um, all three units. So in this question, um, imagine you have a friend, Alex, who says, I would like to live near one of the jobs I've been offered in Southern California. I narrowed it down to the three locations circled on the map. However, I can't afford earthquake insurance. Where do you think I should live? So the students will look at the GPS stations um, nearby and they will provide, create, write a letter to their friend. And you can see in the bullet points there, all the things that the student needs to include in this letter. So it needs to be supported. Um, they need to give clear advice. They need to use words to, describing the data to support their argument and then numerical rates also to support the argument. They refer back to their hypothesis and then they, they explain the links between all these different things that they've looked at. So I'll show you on the next slide the map that they'll look at. 
And um, so here's the three locations. Um, here's the map, and the arrows show um, GPS station movement. So I'd like you to look at that for a little bit and figure out which one would you recommend which of these locations. All right, so when students are doing this, they'll have worked Sorry. through an entire unit. Oops, can you go back for My a bad. second? Sorry. <laughs> <Didn't know that. laughs> um, students will have worked through an entire uh, unit, like looking at you know, what, what's important, what does it mean when the GPS arrows are moving at different rates, and what does that mean for earthquakes. In this case, when you're looking at it, um, you'll see that Palm Springs and Borrego Springs are both surrounded by arrows that have different lengths. They're moving at different rates. And that means that the ground is increasing in strain, which means an earthquake is more likely not a good place to move if you, or to recommend to your friend in, these, um, in this situation. On the other hand, El Cajon um, is surrounded by arrows that have the same length, which means that the ground, there's no strain um, uh, on the ground in this location. So that would be the one that students should recommend. All right, so this module has um, a few strengths, and one of the strengths is its flexibility. Um, so people, uh, faculty can use this um, as an individual unit or as a complete module. You don't have to go through it from beginning to end. You can just say, oh, I'd like to do the groundwater module, and you can do that in your class if you'd like, or in a lab. Um, and the component can be used as homework or in class or in lab. Um, and it can also be used in all size classrooms, um, which uh, is, uh, gives it a lot of flexibility. Um, and again, students can work individually, they can work in small groups, you can have large group discussions, again, you can structure it um, in, in different ways. Um, you can also use it, um, one of our testers used it just sequentially in labs, so he used Unit 1, Unit 2, Unit 3, to Unit 4 in four weeks. Um, and when I did it in my class, I gave Unit 1 at the beginning of semester, but then I did Unit 2 when we did earthquakes, and then um, a couple months later I did um, the plate, I did the glaciers, and then uh, like a couple weeks later I did groundwater. So I spaced it out in my class based on what topic we were talking about in lecture at the time. Another strength of the module is that you're using real-world data to solve society-relevant problems. And, um, Finally, the module um, models scientific thought where it has um, it guides students to approach reading data as scientists read data. And the next page gives an example of how this is done, uh, where this is uh, too small, I don't expect you to be able to read this, um, but it gives you an example where at the beginning of each, um, uh, the activity one for each of these units, um, you, it's in, a geoscientist introduces themselves. So in this case, it's, hi, I'm Jordan, a geoscientist, um, and it, you know, basically I will guide you through this, and I'll give you kind of tips along the way. And it really models kind of some of thought, like I don't just describe the data in words, I also use numbers to describe it. And, you know, the, like I do it this way, and it kind of, it kind of explains, you know, why they're doing different things, and then gives students some hints as well, which is helpful for the students. Um, so in units two through four, again, we try to structure it so that there's similar questions. So students build these skills and become more familiar with them over time. Um, so in each of these units, students are going to examine two or three hypotheses explaining the causes of ground motion, and then they're going to analyze data to determine which of these hypotheses makes the most sense. Um, they also learn how to calculate and describe their annual range. Um, that's in units three and four. But then all three, they're um, calculating, describing the long-term rate of the data. Um, and then finally, um, in all three, they're giving advice to a real-world problem, and they have to back it up with the data that they've collected. All right, so here's an example from Unit 3. Um, this is a GPS station near Skagway Glacier in Alaska um, showing uh, data that students would look at. Did you want me to go forward? Yeah. Okay. Um, so when um, students so this is kind of the first uh, thing that we do with the students. We have them look at the data, we have them describe it roughly, but then we present them with these two hypotheses. 
So hypothesis A is um, the ground elevation rises because the ground expands when it freezes and it lowers when the ground contracts as it thaws. Hypothesis B, the ground elevation lowers because the weight of the snow presses it down and the ground elevation rises when the snow melts. So students look at these two hypotheses and it's going to be their job throughout this um, activity to figure out which one of these hypotheses is more likely. So the first thing we have them do is make predictions for each hypothesis. So that's the first thing I'd like you to do um, is to make predictions. So for each of these hypotheses, I want you to kind of figure out, kind of circle in your head, um, which one of these responses um, would fit each hypothesis. So I'll give you about 20 more seconds. Okay, and so uh, the next slide shows the answers here. Um, so you can see uh, this would be a way then to distinguish hypothesis A from hypothesis B, is to look at the timing of the highest point and the timing of the lowest point each year um, in the GPS data. So if we go back or go to the next slide, which has the, um, the vertical position again, um, so what I want you to do is I want you to pick a year, doesn't matter which year, um, pick a year and then um, you're going to figure out what is the m approximate month of the highest point and then also figure out what the annual range is. Um, and the box at the bottom is the box that we give students to guide them to how to you know, figure out what the range is. So I'll give you, um, let's see, oh yes, we have the poll um, that you can enter in the highest, what month is the highest position. All right, I think we'll end it there. So. 88% of people voted for October, um, and a few people voted for uh, June. Okay. All right, good. So, um, yeah, so it depends a little bit on what year you cho chose, but it should be somewhere between about September and December is where you're seeing um, the highest um, position for each month. Um, and then the next poll is going to ask you what the, um, what the range of vertical motion is. Um. Do, did you get the range? I'm not seeing the range. Uh, Andrew? All right, so we don't have a poll. Okay. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Um, so we have the students, uh, they, um, they end up calculating that, again, it varies a little bit based on the year that they choose, but it ends up being between about 30 and 50 millimeters um, ends up being uh, the range of motion for this GPS station each year. Okay. All right, and then another thing that we give them is we give them pictures of the station, which are also available um, on the website where you can find the data. Um, we do provide the data in the, uh, within the module, um, but if you do want students to go collect their own and go find their own GPS station and their own data, um, you can do that as well, and you can find pictures of the data. Um, and that's, uh, uh, that's through the UNAVCO website. And so here's a picture, picture showing, um, students end up figuring this out. I'm kind of giving you the end result here, but you can see in kind of September, October, um, the elevation is at the highest and that's when there's no snow. And then the picture in December, the elevation is dropping and you can see there is snow. And again, you think about the two hypotheses um, and you can kind of figure out which one matches the best now. Uh, hopefully, um, we can see that. So if you want to go to the next slide, you can see the hypotheses again. Um, and so hypothesis A, basically the ground expands when it freezes. And then hypothesis B, um, the ground lowers due to the weight of the snow. So you can think about which one makes more sense based on the data we just saw. All right, and so the answer is hypothesis B. So students figure this out, that this is why the ground is moving up and down. 
All right, and then we have a video that students watch. So this is the second part of the activity, and we'll play the video for you. Um, and students have questions then that they look at, they answer during the video. Measuring how much ice is in a glacier is challenging. Satellite pictures tell only part of the story. This animation shows how sensitive instruments, such as GPS stations on nearby bedrock, can help us determine changes in a nearby glacier. Glaciers accumulate ice at higher elevations and migrate downslope due to gravity. This animation, modeled after Helheim Glacier in East Greenland, illustrates ice draining from the Greenland ice sheet to the ocean. Large fractures, or crevasses, form where the ice flows faster than it can deform. Many glaciers end in the ocean, or in large fjords. The grounding line is where a glacier transitions from being grounded on bedrock to floating on the water. Beyond the grounding line, crevasses can propagate through the glacier, causing large blocks to break off as icebergs. Zooming out, glaciers lie upon tectonic plates that maintain a buoyant equilibrium with the asthenosphere. When mass is added to or removed from the Earth's surface, the adjustment of the tectonic plates results in small changes in the elevation of Earth's surface. This process, called elastic adjustment, is an immediate response of the tectonic plate to a change in loading. The thickening and thinning of glaciers is one example of a process that adds or removes mass from the Earth's surface. These changes aren't noticeable by humans. Only sensitive instruments such as GPS can measure this subtle vertical change of the bedrock surface. Elastic adjustment, exaggerated here, occurs on short timescales and is sensitive to even small changes in mass. When the glacier is thicker, the Earth's bedrock surface lowers. When the glacier is thinner, the bedrock surface rises. The graph in the upper right will illustrate how the vertical movement of the GPS receiver changes as the glacier gains and loses mass over time. In the winter, when two to four meters of additional snow can fall on Greenland glaciers, the bedrock surface lowers due to the additional weight. Note that the surface lowers only a few millimeters for two to four meters of snowfall. In the summer, the snow that accumulated over the winter melts, and the meltwater runs off to the ocean. This loss in mass causes the bedrock surface to rise as the tectonic plate readjusts. In the summer of 2004, Helheim Glacier began to accelerate and thin, doubling the amount of ice discharged into the ocean. This increase in mass loss caused uplift of the bedrock surface that was measured by high-precision GPS. From 2004 to 2011, mass loss from Helheim and surrounding glaciers resulted in 75 millimeters of uplift. The annual sawtooth pattern shows the smaller magnitude seasonal cycles of snowfall and snowmelt. The broader seven-year trend of steady uplift of the land is caused by glacial thinning and ice mass loss. The dashed red line shows the extent of the glacier in 2001. In addition to Helheim Glacier, recent acceleration and thinning of many other glaciers around Greenland has been revealed by GPS measurements of the bedrock elevation. Bedrock uplift rates are shown here as arrows of relative vertical motion. These highlight the net loss of ice from the Greenland ice sheet that is discharging to the ocean and contributing to sea level rise. GPS monitoring has enabled us to understand glacial changes at a much more detailed level. So if I can just jump in, there's there's one of these animations for each of the different modules. And if you get them on YouTube, you can get Spanish um, closed caption as well as English. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, thank you. OK, um, so then the last um, kind of activity in the glacier unit, students are looking at the long term change in glaciers. So this is a different glacier. This is Helheim Glacier in Greenland. And this is, uh, students will be looking at the long-term rate of um, motion of that GPS station. So um, what we have students do is we have students pick a five-year interval and then um, calculate the rate. So we're going to have you do that. And again, you know, students have pieces of paper and they can do it. You know, it's a lot of, they can write all over it and it's a little, t little tougher on the screen, but you can still probably estimate um, the rate um, over a five-year period. And go ahead and type that in, right? 
<laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. So go ahead and tap it, in, type it into the chat box, and every everyone's going to pick different five-year periods, so the rates will end up being not exactly the same as each other. And that's okay. No one wants to go first. So thank you to the brave that came in with it first. <laughs> Do you want to <laughs> take it from here, Karen? Okay. All right. Um, so we can see that it's driving. Um, and again, the students' rates are going to vary a little bit depending on exactly where you know what what they're measuring from. But that's okay. We're you know we're working um, with real data, and real data are are messy. Okay. All right, next slide. Um, so then students, um, now having gone through all this, now they have, uh, this is the question that they're gonna be answering. So imagine you have a cousin, Maria, who says, who cares if the sizes of Glacier are changing? It won't affect me on the East Coast of the United States. I just won't invest in Glacier tourism. Instead, I'm gonna invest in beachfront property for when I retire. Um, so students need to agree or disagree and write um, a letter to Maria Again, kind of using their data to support their argument. Um, and again, kind of at the same bullet points that the students need to re receive full credit. Okay, um, so that was unit three. Unit four, I just wanna give you a bit of a flavor as to what unit four is, which is the groundwater and water resources. Um, students are looking at um, the valleys and the mountains in California and comparing changes when there's regular rainfall compared to when there's drought. So comparing the GPS motion in those two different situations. Um, so here's the data they're looking at um, where uh, the left two figures are the mountains and the right two um, graphs are showing the GPS stations in the valley. You can see the valleys, um, they're decreasing um, and that's um, due to the groundwater withdrawal. And this is kind of what students work towards. And finally, the last wrap-up question then for Unit 4 um, has – oh, Sorry. this is – so they fill, yeah, they fill in a chart. No, go ahead, go to the next one. They fill in a chart kind of comparing all these different information with regular and drought. All right, and then the last question um, is there's a politician who says farmers need water to grow crops, and crops provide millions of dollars for the California economy. Um, so we should let farmers take all the groundwater they need, especially during the droughts. Their use of water helps all of us. Um, so again, students need to agree or disagree, and they need to support um, the argument using um, GPS data, um, as well as some other data that has to do with um, kind of some of the ec economics of it. Okay. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about a little bit is some of the challenges and solutions to using um, this module, a uh, GPS module for Getsy. Um, so one of the challenges we found is that students don't answer the questions thoroughly, even though we give them the bullet points of what they need to include when they're answering the questions. Um, a lot of them don't, don't include all those bullet points. Um, of many of them at the beginning uh, forget to give the rates, the numerical rates. Um, and so these are just some example student responses where the students did not get full credit on this response. Um, so as a solution to this, um, we, uh, we do ask similar questions over units two through four so students get some practice with this. Um, and we ask them then, you can ask them to reflect on why they missed points. Um, we also provide example responses. So here's uh, just for the letter to Maria, we have um, four example responses that instructors can, you can use these kind of how you want, like how you think would best fit into your class, again, to help support the students. 
Another challenge that we found is that students can get overwhelmed. Um, they're looking at data, they're doing a lot of math, and this can be overwhelming for them. Um, there's also a lot of questions that we ask because we really want to guide students to understand kind of how and why things work. Um, and some of these modules end up, they look longer than they are, but they look kind of long so the students can get overwhelmed. Um, we found that a solution for this is really to break it up. Um, so you can do, for example, parts one and two as lecture or as homework, and then part three can be your lab. Or you can do part one in lab one week, part two, which is watching the video as homework, and then part three in the lab um, the following week. So breaking it up is very helpful for students. And finally, grading. You're probably looking at this and saying, I can't grade all that. <laughs> I don't have TAs. Um, so that's another challenge. However, you know, I have to grade things too, and my colleague does too. So we provided um, a lot of the questions for multiple choice. Um, so here's an example of a multiple choice question. Again, so it's a lot easier to grade when they're multiple choice. Um, another solution is that not all the questions need to be graded. So we have some synth synthesis questions. So in this example, write a summary sentence describing blah, 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 blah. You don't have to grade the questions before that. You just need to look at the summary and see if the students got that correct. And finally, um, we do provide uh, rubrics and checklists with, um, for the questions with the longer answers. So that's an example of the rubric. And then um, I actually found when I was grading, just using that checklist was very helpful for me where I can just put an X if the student didn't do it or circle it if the student did do it. And so um, it was you know, quite quick to go through it and grade that. Um, so grading is always an issue. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thanks, Karen. Um, I just thought I would uh, really quickly um, show you what the website looks like so you can see the components of it. Um, oops. Um, and so is that, are we seeing the website now? Yeah. Really? Yes. Okay, great. So this is the Getsy website. Um, and so we'll just look at uh, Karen and Jess's um, module here. Um, and so if you're familiar with integrate modules, this will look quite familiar to you. Um, but on this front page that we have the summary and some of the strengths of the module that she brought up. And then you have an overview page that just lists this um, sort of a, a one paragraph about each of these, but there's the different units. And then in addition to the units, there's a page um, called student materials that you could send students straight to to see just sort of the the animation links and the PDFs there's additional assessment um, questions that could be used in quizzes um, or exams and there's instructor stories to give you a flavor of what it looked like on an East Coast Community College a West Coast Community College and R1 um, land-grant University and just to see how different instructors um, have uh, uh, done it. If we look at unit two, uh, you'll see summary and goals, uh, the context for where this could probably be used, and then the description and the teaching materials. And so as she talked about, there's uh, the first activity. The second activity in units two through four is always the animation. So you can either get the animation as a file or on YouTube. And then um, the somewhat longer exercise for um, unit three, we actually provide all the spreadsheets and the, um, if you're interested in looking at the spreadsheet level data. So that's um, what you get um, on the web page. So let's see. go back to the PowerPoint. Are you seeing the PowerPoint again? Yeah. Great. So we want to make sure that you get some time to um, also get a chance to ask your questions. So um, questions about the module teacher. I see a question has come in, teach, I teach an online or science course, what recommendations do you have to effectively utilize the module in units? Do you want to say anything, Karen? Um, sure. Um, so I think that's a great question. I think that this is actually a really good context for using um, the online um, courses. It's a really great place to use these units. Um, so the so the student page that uh, Beth just showed is a place where you can direct students to get all of the directions and all of the data so they can they can download it themselves. Um, you can also put it onto your course management system as well. And uh, I would definitely suggest student, having students, uh, you know, in discussion groups or, or somehow communicate 
communicate with each other to ask questions of each other as they're going through it because some of these questions are, are difficult for students, um, especially ones that don't have as much practice with looking at quantitative data. And so students, um, so having the students, you know, assuring them uh, that they can ask questions, giving them that opportunity to ask each other questions or ask you questions, I think would be a very helpful so they don't, they don't get stuck um, on something. Um, so another question came in, is this all, oh, I'll, I'm jumping around a little bit, I'll get to the others too. Uh, is this material all open source? And the answer is yes, it's all related, released under the Creative Commons license, which means that you can um, uh, take it, adapt it, change it, as long as you um, don't charge anybody for it and you maintain some level of attribution of where your source was. And so um, to that end, if you're teaching online or whatever teaching format you're in, you can download these materials, you can put them on your, you know, Blackboard or your, your class interactive, you can, and we provide everything, um, all of the exercises in Word versions as well. So you could be like, I don't like, like the last section of here, I'm going to nix those questions and add something about, you know, where I teach, you know, in Alaska. So um, we try to uh, make it as flexible as possible. If you go to the um, instructor stories um, page, there is also a link to a page from Integrate on hybrid and um, online teaching too, which might have some tips that are coming to us at this point. Someone else asked, how can we relate geodetic and seismic data for undergraduate courses. Um, well, we don't have any set teaching resources that do combine those two, um, but actually a lot of our animations have been um, done at least in collaboration to some level between Iris, which runs the geodetic, or the, sorry, the seismic facility and UNAVCO, which runs the geodetic facility. Um, and I guess, Iris uh, has a lot of teaching resources. They tend to be more upper K-12 oriented, but that can work quite well at the intro level. So although we do not actually have resources that combine those two right now, I think there's a lot of potential to, to look and see, you know, a geodetic plate tectonic activity and a seismic plate tectonic activity and animations um, and, and combine them in your own way. Um, I teach an online, okay, so we got, this. um, how do I get precise coordinates from, uh, GPS stations? So, um, if you, because this is an intro level module, we don't send the students to the data portals, um, uh, directly, but if on any of the unit pages, if you go down to the bottom of the resources, uh, you will see the, um, the data files that, and the spreadsheets and their links there to the data portals. So if you're interested or to the spreadsheets. So if you're interested in getting the daily position files yourself, you, we have them up through, um, the end of 2017, I think, in this module, and um, you can get them up to yesterday um, by going to the online portal that we do link out. Um, let's see, I think that's all the questions that have come in. Um, so that actually kind of brought us to the second question we wanted to bring up to the group, which is um, questions about research GPS or methods, applications or data, if anybody has any questions sort of more on the technical side. Um, online materials, did you have the relative plate motions observed um, through the GPS sites? So I'm not fully sure I understand that question, um, but on the unit two, which is plate tectonics and earthquakes, um, students do, um, they're using the, well, in unit one, they learn about reference frames um, and so the difference between sort of a global reference frame and a we're going to compare everything to the eastern US which isn't moving much and deforming much itself internally and then that's called the North American reference frame and that gives you a clearer view of what 
all the activity on the Western US where there's a lot more deformation. And so we do go through the process of helping students understand um, reference frames and it is repeated again in unit two, like in the animation, it goes over reference frames. Do you wanna say anything about that, Karen? Um, no, I think you, that was, that's what we do with reference frames. So I think that's a good, um, good description of it. Okay, yeah, so there's a, both a sort of data interaction version and uh, and I get to see it in an animation and hopefully they get the sense for it by by that time. Um, just curious about the cost of one of these stations. My students will ask, oh, that's a good question. Um, they, that, it, so the installation of these stations occurred sort of in the 15 years ago uh, most of them approximately 15 years ago, uh, some sort of between 12 and 25 years ago, depending on the station. And um, each of them cost tens of thousands of dollars to put in between the staff and the drill trucks. And then um, there's millions of dollars per year devoted to maintaining the um, the over 1200 stations that are part of, it used to be called the Plate Boundary Observatory. Now that's linked to other um, networks. It's now called the Network of the Americas, also NOTA, which is approaching to over 1200, but um, um, up to 2000 stations are actually processed. So that's, it's hard to give you a dollar value, but I think you could easily say tens of thousands of dollars per station and more every year. <laughs> and then, Finally, we had one more question. Um, in your experience, what are some challenges and solutions to having introductory students work with data? If anybody has anything that they want to share, I know we're pretty much out of time. Uh, but if anyone has anything they would like to contribute, just give it a minute or two to collect. Okay, I'm not sure if anyone's gonna put anything in for that. Um, so I think we'll wrap it. Um, and I just wanted to say that, again, that this is part of the um, NAGT, National Association of Geoscience Teachers on the Cutting Edge webinar program. There will be another Getsy webinar um, related to a majors level climate change module um, on November 13th, but that is not the next webinar in the series. There will be one um, on October 31st, next week, Thursday, um, related to solving climate by 2030 um, from the Solar Dominance Program. Anything else you want to add, Andrew? Nope. But if you saw, other than if you saw the chat, oh, please yes, fill out the please. webinar survey on your way out. That would be great. It's about three or four up from the bottom on the chat. If you could just spend a minute or two to fill that out, it really helps us make sure that um, we're going in a direction that's helpful for this and future for future webinars. Thanks so much. <laughs>